Okay. This is one I've been excited for. I'm so happy to see you here, Dick. Dick, the, the creator of the MEDIC acronym, a kick-ass salesperson, something I saw firsthand when we worked together at Sprinkler and a world-class sales network leader, but most of all, someone I'm proud to call a friend. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Mr. Dick Dunkel, who will be sharing unique masterful insights on selling to the economic buyer. Take it away, Dick. Over to you, my friend. Thank you, Andy. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you guys and very excited to be a part of uh, Medicon and, uh, you know, the whole community that uh, that Andy and his team are building. So great to be with you all. So I do want to spend the next 20 minutes um, sharing with you guys some perspectives around economic buyer selling and why that's so important today and maybe provide a few tips and suggestions on uh, how to help you be more successful uh, in this critical you know, selling uh, aspect. So uh, look, I mean, we all understand that Medic is the foundation. It is represents the fundamental things that have to be accomplished over the course of any sales playbook. But we'll, we'll talk about specifically about economic buyer selling engagement um, and how to leverage you know, economic buyer engagement. So let's talk about the current selling environment that we're in today, right? We all know uh, the nature of the world that we're living in today. Budget cuts, you know, purchases are being scrutinized more than ever. And, uh, and so, you know, let's also think about the realities that our executives are facing, right? Executives are under incredible pressure today. They're being benchmarked against their peers. They're being measured against targeted KPIs and they're looking for answers, right? They're consulting their trusted advisors. They're looking for insights and answers to help address their top business challenges. And the reality is that executives have to be more focused than ever today. You know, they can't solve world hunger, but they can focus on addressing specific challenges that they face and they've got to prioritize. And this is where, you know, our ability to sort of understand that the information, leverage the information that's out there today gives us a unique opportunity to strategically align with them. And that's what we're going to talk about. So more than ever today, you know, uh, in this year, sellers need to increase their understanding of how they can strategically align to the priorities of their economic buyers and elevate their engagements so that they are able to align their offerings to those strategic priorities. And so some of you might be thinking, well, can't the executive figure that out themselves? All I need to do is just show them their product, my, my amazing product, and they can connect the dots. They can see how I can help them. And the answer to that is, you know, the cold, harsh reality is that economic buyers and executives do not care about your product. They care about what your product can do for them. So a quick refresher on the power of the economic buyer, right? Economic buyers can override or veto recommendations. They can move money either to or from your project. They can direct key players, you know, the people that are change agents and have the potential to become real champions for you, um, you know, to support uh, your, your hypothesis, which we'll talk about. They can accelerate your sales cycle and increase your deal size. Uh, help you establish more strategic relationships and also eventually refer you to fellow fellow executives either inside or outside the organization. And so I think we all get it, right? Executive engagement is critical. But yet, according to Forrester, uh, serious decisions research, only 10% of executives rate sales calls as valuable enough to have warranted the time they spent on them. So, you know, there's something that's mi we're missing something, right? Let's let's think about what that is. You know, why do most sellers miss the mark? when it comes to initiating and maintaining senior level relationships. You know, the reality is that most of us do not spend a lot of time engaging with executives, right? Our comfort zone is with the mid-level managers, you know, the people who actually care about the features and functions of our product or the capabilities or services that we deliver um, and are not as focused on kind of the business outcomes that they drive. And so we tend to gravitate, you know, when we're in critical situations, we tend to sort of gravitate to our comfort zone, right? So the, so the thing that we have to realize is that engaging with executives is a different experience. You have to have a different mindset, right? You have to learn to sort of think more like them. And uh, so let's see if we can do that. Um, so I listed out five common mistakes uh, that I've seen through my experience in coaching and developing account executives 
um, over the years. And, uh, and so, you know, the first one is a very basic one. It's just not identifying the senior leaders who have the potential to influence your decision. So it's not just the immediate decision maker, but there's also other executives that have influence, not researching the strategic priorities of the business and aligning your potential solution to those priorities, ineffective communication, not communicating to executives as an executive, not taking a multi-pronged or you know multi-vector approach to account penetration, and not uncovering potential funding sources. So let's go through each of these. So number one, identify senior leaders who can influence your decision. You have to think beyond the users that are just affected immediately, directly by the change. You also have to sort of think about the consequences and the others uh, that are sort of downstream or upstream from the change that you're proposing. Learn their names, learn their titles. Um, you know, when you begin to sort of use that in, as part of your, your language with anybody that you're talking to in the organization, right, you're perceived in a different light. If, if you're for public companies, uh, you know, you're researching 10Ks, you can understand and learn how they are compensated. Um, if you know how the executives that you're trying to reach are actually compensated, and I'm going to show you in a minute how you do that, um, it changes the conversation. Understand their respective roles. And then also, the other thing you have to do is you got to, you know, maybe reach beyond your own customer base, but talk to your peers, talk to your boss, talk to your colleagues around the country, around, around the world, and know the names and understand who the, the executives and leaders are of, in your customer base, people who you could specifically refer to, people who have the potential to, to be references uh, when you get to that point in the cycle. And so um, I'm not going to read this, but I will share this, and Andy will share this with you guys. Um, again, th these are just instructions on how to actually find how your executives are compensated. And this is for, you know, American uh, U.S. security registered companies. Uh, and there are similar processes for international companies. But the, the, the fact of the matter is the information is out there. And again, uh, taking the time to understand how your execs are paid um, can really give you a competitive advantage. Okay, point number two, aligning to your target's account strategic priorities. This might be the most important point of all. You know, look for strategies and initiatives. Do the research. Read the 10K. Look at the earnings announcement. And look for strategic initiatives and strategies that are directly associated with what you're offering can provide. Um, you have to, sometimes you have to sort of be a little bit creative, but think about the capabilities that you provide and how do they attach to you know, improving on time delivery? How do they attach to improving working capital? How do they attach to potentially impacting, you know, cash flow? When you do that, right, you're now able to elevate the conversation and, and you know, leverage research tools. Uh, like we use a product called Databook. It's excellent. Uh, it basically helps to sort of accelerate the process of research and surfaces strategic priorities for the accounts that we're targeting. Leverage what you've learned uh, and also leverage what you've learned from your installed customer base then identify the executives that are attached to, the, to those initiatives. This is how you're identifying, you know, who are the key people that you should be reaching? Um, and, then, and then obviously, what's the message? We're going to talk about the messaging piece as well. The other thing is that this is a very valuable exercise as you are doing your account prioritization. If you're a strategic account executive and you have 10 accounts or 20 accounts, you really have to be smart about which accounts are you really focusing your efforts on, right? When you take the time to understand what are their strategic priorities and how well are you able to map your solution to those? It's an excellent way for you to, to, to do that account prioritization exercise. So we use something called a value pyramid. Many of you have maybe already seen this before, but um, this, this simple framework illustrates your understanding of their business. And it sets an expectation that the way that we're going to engage with you is that we want to strategically align with you if you become a customer, right? We want to make sure that the, the value that we're providing, the, the problems that we're solving are directly attached to the things that matter most to your business. So the value pyramid will guide you to their strategic priorities and, uh, and ultimately help you to understand the risks and challenges that they have. So here's a simple example of one that we, we might have here at Salonis. Corporate objectives look like shareholder values. Business strategies are things like customer growth and retention. Initiatives. So a common initiative that we like to attach to are things like improve on time delivery by X percent by Y date. So you've got somebody that's trying to improve a mission critical business process. So this is all sourced research. This is information that's coming directly from the customer's 
you know, financial reports, or it may be coming from sort of general industry information if it's a privately held company. But now here we get to the point that we, you know, this is where we start to get into the hypothesis. And this is based on our experience with our customers. And so our hypothesis is that as a company that's a, as a manufacturing company or a distribution company that's trying to improve on time delivery, you know, oftentimes with businesses like this, we see challenges in inventory management and, tra- and a lack of transparency and also and also the need to be able to measure and recognize supplier performance issues. And so if those issues, in fact, exist for your company, we can help. Right. And so you can see the difference between the information that's been validated versus the information that's sort of the beginning of our hypothesis. We're formulating a hypothesis because we want to come with a point of view. We have some specific ideas about how we can help. And so we're going from hypothesis to when we when we get that engagement. Now we can actually go right to discovery. We can say, well, let's see if these challenges exist or if you believe other challenges exist. Right. We can now begin to to engage in discovery which then leads to requirements. And once we've, you know, the better we do at discovery, the better our, the richer our requirements are, the bigger our opportunity is. So just keep this in mind, right? Rather than asking a business leader, what's keeping you up at night, be ready to share insights as to what should be. All right, point number three, effective communication. Again, I'm going to go back to what I said at the very beginning. I see so many account executives are sort of trying to speak to executives like they would speak to a mid-level manager, right? Don't do it. It doesn't work. You won't get through. They won't, they won't engage, right? You've got to leverage your hypothesis, and it's got to be specifically tailored at a targeted. It must be dis- bespoke. It, the message that you craft to an executive must be written in a way that they would know immediately that this message was intended for me and me alone. Okay. Um, you cannot do a, you cannot do a spray and pray and hope to get to, through to an executive. So be ready to share how you've helped similar executives in their industry. And then again, the reality check is they don't care about your product. They don't care about your title. Actually, they don't even care about your name. All they're interested in is, you know, have you done this before? Um, do you understand my business? And, you know, is there po- the potential for you to be able to help me? Right. They do care about these things. Uh, Think about this. How much, how soon and how sure, how much money can you save me or make me? How soon can you make that happen? And what's the likelihood of success? And then engagement happens when they believe you understand their business and that they have a reason to believe that you can help them. Right. If those things are in place, they will they will engage or they will you know, ask you to to work with their team. Here's a really simple framework we use. Um, it's a taxonomy for executive outreach, and it basically has three, three or four pieces. It's, it's about number one, cr- establishing credibility uh, and, and, and getting their attention, demonstrating business acumen, and then having a proof point and an ask. And so it might look like something like this. You know, you can, sh- you can say, I was referred to you by, or in your most recent earnings announcement, you said, uh, we've engaged with X and Y teams across your organization. We've worked with X number of peers in your industry. Uh, we've collaborated with your consulting partner in other accounts and then a proof point. And then finally, you know, I'll reach out to your assistant to schedule a brief introduction. Our typical executive outreaches are three or four sentences. And if you're if you're writing a long winded message that has a description of your product or service, right, you're going down the wrong path. OK, point number four, take a multi vectored approach to making contact. Executives are busy and skeptical. They rely on trusted advisors to help filter information. So you've got to coordinate your outreach across multiple channels and vectors. In fact, actually, there was a recent study that showed that you're three times more likely to make contact when you leverage multiple channels. Of course, you can reach out directly, but leverage leverage your leadership, right? Work with their assistant, develop a relation, working relationship there. Consider working through their strategic partners. You know, I'll just share a little bit about Salonis. We are a company that helps companies improve their business processes. And so very oftentimes we find ourselves working with large consulting firms, Accenture, Deloitte, KPMG, e right? They are the executive's trusted advisors. And so we work, We oftentimes we're actually making the pitch to the consulting partner and the consulting partners is then sort of introducing us, right? Because they've got an established relationship. So think about whether or not there's a strategic partnership relationship, whether it might be, you know, a, a complementary technology or, or on the consulting side. Um, and then, of course, leverage things like customers and events. You know, we do we do something called a world tour, which is, a, you know, which, you know, what, you know, oftentimes we have partners inviting uh, senior leaders to uh, to to this kind of marquee industry event. And then lastly, and most importantly, don't give up. 
you know, I think one of the things that we find is that oftentimes, you know, we see this with our sellers is that they get engaged and they stop trying to get to the executive or they're waiting for permission from the mid-level managers to give them, to get them access, right? Don't give up, make, take a multi-layered approach to, you know, getting to executives. And the reality is that most likely the people that you're dealing with at the mid-level don't even know the executives that actually need to need to have visibility to you know to you if you want to be able to develop a strategic relationship. So take a multi-threaded approach and don't you know don't put yourself in the box. Uh, the best way to avoid the box is to actually try to have some outreach, executive outreach before you engage with those mid-level managers. Okay, point number five: uncover potential funding sources. So again, uh, you know this is something that I think is oftentimes neglected. Um, it's not paid close enough attention to, I think, in many of the organizations that I've spoken with. And so, you know, taking the time to understand how projects, purchases, things are funded, um, you know, have that curiosity to understand that when you do, it really can inform you better in terms of your own time management, and it can really reveal uh, things about the decision process. So it's about identifying, you know, it can help you to identify the economic buyer, key stakeholders, and uh, of course, help you to manage your timeline. So when we talk about funding structures and understanding funding structures, you know, this is, uh, this the funding structures define how funds are allocated and made available, and they vary by organization, business unit, and department. Um, they might be centralized or decentralized for large uh, global organizations. They can be organized by function or geographically. Tightly, tightly, um, you know, defined things are things like things that end up in RFPs. But then you can also have sort of broadly defined funds, which are for large strategic transformational initiatives, or it's, it can be some combination of the above. So really think about, you know, kind of the nature of your organization and ask questions that can help you to understand the potential sources of funding. And it'll give you a whole new perspective on your opportunity. So we ask questions. It's like, you know, of course, the obvious one, right? Is there a defined budget? But also things like, you know, how are funds secured for unplanned investments? And then finally, the you know, the question we love is if we were able to show that a larger investment would yield a much greater return, who would have to approve that increased spend? Right. That's that's an eye opening conversation for you to have with a mid-level manager that's never really thought about, you know, sort of discretionary spending. OK, so. You know, we, we talk a lot. I know Andy talks a lot about how important it is to influence the decision process, the decision criteria, but it, you also have the ability to influence the decision process. And so the way that you sell, the way that you articulate your value has a lot to do with, you know, who you get to talk to, right? You get delegated to who you sound like. And so, you know, who do you engage? You know, are you communicating at a level that will, you know, uh, open the door to senior level people? Um, and then, you know, that's going to determine, you know, are you going to have to wait for budget or is your value hypothesis compelling that potentially might unlock uh, discretionary or strategic funds? And will you position your solution as an investment aligned to the strategic priorities of an economic buyer? Right. These are things that can actually take what might normally be in a sort of a very regimented process might be a, uh, a 12 month or 16 month process from evaluation to funding to approval to purchase to an accelerated process because you're attaching yourself to something that matters to the executives this year. So, you know, you'll, you'll see here on the left, you know, you have the value pyramid. Um, and at the very bottom, you have specified allocation, which is very tactical and planned. And this is typically controlled by a project owner. These are the sales cycles that take a year. Okay. Um, above that, now you also have kind of that discretionary spending, which is sort of funds that are allocated for strategic initiatives that are to be specified. And these are accessible by senior leaders. And then above that, you have unbudgeted investments, AKA off balance sheet investments that are accessible by the C-suite. And if you look at this, right, this actually maps to the value pyramid. These are objectives and strategies. These are targeted initiatives. And these are the execution challenges and the requirements. Right. So so layer this. Think about think about what level are you communicating at? The reality is you have to be able to communicate across the entire value pyramid. You, right. You need to understand the strategic priorities. You need to understand um, 
you know, the targeted in initiatives, the execution challenges, and the required capabilities. When you understand that entire stack, it gives you a framework that will enable you to speak to anybody in the organization. And of course, this is also directly related to the size of the deal, right? And so these, these, these engagements with the project owner, with the defined budget, right? This is the, in our world, this is a, this is a $50,000 deal. Um, in, in this opportunity where you're actually accessing an initial, you know, sort of strategic investment, this is a, you know, 150 to $250,000 deal. And then the off balance sheet investment is, is the million dollar in potentially multi-million dollar opportunity. So five keys to executive engagement, understand their lands, understand the exact landscape and the org structure, do the research, understand their priorities, right? And then communicate effectively, be focused, impactful, right? Take an executive tone, multi, multi vector approach. We talked about that. Leverage your leaders, uncover the funding sources. It'll shed light on your time management and your account. Okay. So, you know, to kind of wrap it up here, executives will engage with you when you focus on their challenges, their priorities, their objectives, that you share your message using their language and their KPIs and share credible examples of where you've done this before. So let's take a minute and talk about timing. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so on the topic of timing, we've already talked about sort of the things that we need to do at the beginning. Let's talk about kind of what happens in the middle. So we call this executive alignment. And, and we've actually determined that executive alignment is really sort of the key to success. Um, this is a fundamental selling skill of pre-commitment, right? This is where we're getting agreement that, um, that we, if we're going to invest more time and energy, that we have a basis for doing business. And then finally, the executive readout, I'll, I'll talk more about in a minute. But, you know, we, 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 we refer to this thing when we talk about executive selling, we call it the W. And the W in an idea, this is almost the perfect sales cycle here, is that in, in the perfect sales cycle, right, we're getting sponsorship. We're generating interest early with, with, a, with an executive sponsor that's then leading to discovery. And then discovery is where we're ch developing champions that then lead to kind of that mid-stage alignment where we're getting commitment before we commit the resources. Um, then we execute the validation and then we do the readout where this is really our final proposal and negotiation. So think about think about the W as really defining sort of the three touch points for executive uh, oversight and then sort of those critical midpoint things that happen that actually drive the deal and help us to gather sort of the, uh, the ground support that's needed. So I'll just share with you very quickly a recent finding that we had. We've done research on this in our own company, and we actually found that for land opportunities where executive, we, we measure the effectiveness of every sales stage. For land opportunities where the executive alignment stage was thoroughly executed are 10 times more likely to close in quarter than those of incomplete ex execution. So this is actually a perfect opportunity for us to sort of make the go, no go decision, qualify in or qualify out, right? Should we continue or should we take a step back? Maybe we haven't identified a large enough problem. Maybe we're not dealing with the right people. Maybe, maybe we don't really have a champion, right? This is a perfect opportunity where we can sort of pause and make sure that we're not wasting company resources. Okay. Uh, final comment, uh, executive, executive engagement drives sales performance, right? Bring a business mindset to preparation and engagement and your ability to formulate and present a credible value hypothesis will open doors and elevate your conversations. Okay, that's it. I know that was a lot to cover in a short period of time, but obviously super important topic. And, uh, you know, I hope uh, I hope you guys found that valuable. And, uh, and I know Andy will be uh, and team will be sharing this content with you all. Yeah. Yeah, Dick, that was awesome. And I, I feel like even though we talked a little about about this before, you really brought that to life and that, that was just incredible. I can see the chat is just blowing up with people just capital letters left, right, and center, 10 out of 10. Cheryl says, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dick Dunkel. The thing that really stood out, I just I'll just quickly say something that I loved about this. I, obviously the, the the it's so clear how you articulated it. But the thing that really stands out for me with this is if you were to actually sit down with a prospective customer and say, Hey, look, this is what we're gonna do they would only be happy about it right it's like it's like not just professional selling but it enables like that customer to have such a great experience and focusing on the things that that really kind of they care about and it's going to be a good experience for them so i think that's like yeah that's mega mega thank you so so much sir right richard, we should we should you should have a knighthood we, we, can we give you a knighthood sir richard dunkel i think that sounds good doesn't it <laughs> good stuff all right, all right well thank you so so much dick